There is a, a the second stage uh, check off this week, which is to show your the HPS drawing plots from the ODE solver, but with no user interface for setting parameters. So just one example of initial conditions and and uh, uh, parameters, uh, sigma, rho, and uh, beta. Then demonstrated also running under in debug mode, either under signal tab or OLA. Who's going to use signal tab? More general, I think you'll like it. Who's going to use Ola? Who hasn't given it one minute of thought? <laughs> yeah, okay, it's time, folks. This is not easy. So, um, I want to talk a little bit today about uh, uh, more about um, QSIS, but first, are there any questions? or parallel ports or Quartus version 18. It works. It works. And what did you have to do to make it work? A lot. It's only like three things. It's the mech, change the camera, change the LCD screen, and fiddle with the DDR3 controller in QSIS, and that works. So all three of those settings that you described, the uh, uh, camera, the LCD, and the DDR controller are all in QSIS. Yeah. And the camera and the LCD are both in the video config module, yes? Y or yes. are they in video subsystem? I don't remember. One of the two. You have to pop those open and look inside. Yeah. Yeah. And then the DDR3 was some weird thing where you, you set it from DDR3 to DDR2 and back to DDR3 and it magically worked? Yes. That's satisfying. Was that on the SD RAM? That's, yeah. It's inside the HPS configuration somewhere. In the uh, HPS configuration. That's obscure. So those are the three things you have to choose to bring it up to um, the current version of, of uh, Quartus, if you care. Any questions about QSIS? So again, to, to reiterate, every project that you're going to be doing this class is going to require some C code running on the HPS. It's going to require a description of the connection between the HPS and the FPGA, that's QSIS. And then it's going to require that you write custom Verilog that interprets the signals coming over QSIS to do, to do some new logical function. I thought I'd try and go through a couple of examples. One is kind of a variant of what I'm asking you to do for lab one, and that is to, to add a parallel port. And somebody was trying to add SRAM instead of a parallel port. SRAM instead of parallel port? Yeah, we did that. We, you did that? Did, did you get it working? We did, yeah. What was the problem on Friday? Um, we did a regeneration of QSIS. And it, oh, oh, actually, so actually it was, the real problem is it's triggered on the negative edge of the clock, not the positive edge. Aha, uh -huh. okay, so you have to, and, and that was a QSIS problem or that was your code? Uh, that was our code. Okay, so <clears throat> yes, in general, you're going to, on any signal that you're getting from QSIS, you're going to want to synchronize that with the, the rising edge of, a, of, the, of whatever clock you're using. But it was mostly the regeneration of QSIS probably that was keeping it working. Yeah, okay. The, the point here is that you're going to need about 10 parallel I.O. ports to set all of the parameters Three parameters, three initial conditions, read back three values, nine. Nine I.O. ports. And some people think that that's bulky. 
pull out nine uh, parallel I.O. ports on the QSYS when you could use one SRAM block. So you could use one SRAM block which would give you 256 by 32-bit words. Then instead of having a lot of logic in the uh, affair on QSYS for 10 different parallel I.O. ports, instead you'd have logic appearing on in C to choose the address of an SRAM location that you want to write. Um, <clears throat> But I did want to give you an example of a, of a parallel port that I added. And this is a fairly old thing that I did. So the, the, some of the documentation is a little crufty. But what mostly happens here is that the QSYS, well, here's the QSYS layout. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, at the end of this is a parallel I.O. port I call PIO test. It takes a clock input, and in this case, I was fiddling around and I used a, a clock driver on the QSYS bus. Don't do that. Just use the system clock. Use the QSYS system clock. Don't use a clock driver. But you have to give it a clock, you have to give it a reset. Typically it would be off the system clock with the system reset, which is over here. And then S1 is mapped to the lightweight axi bus, because parallel live ports are relatively slow. And then it is exported to PIO underscore test underscore external underscore connection. Because I like long bulky names. There's another parallel I.O. port, which for obscure reasons is separated from the first one by at the meter of uh, QSYS, parallel I.O. LED, which was originally <coughs> called the parallel I.O. port, so it's called the I.O. LED external connection, but I repurposed it for something. So there's two I.O. ports, one called, exports a, uh, a signal called PIO LED external and the other is test external. So if we go to the, what we're going to find in the uh, Verilog, which we'll look at in just a minute, is that the system generated file from QSYS, when you hit generate in QSYS, generates a big Verilog file. One thing that's generated is a header module, and there's two extra lines down in the header module. PIO LED external connection export. So QSYS added the underscore export to both the, of the names that I chose on the QSYS format. And then I wrote, routed those to two vectors in my Verilog, which I will now show you. Any questions on that? So an exported connection appeared parallel. An exported connection appears in Verilog. So oh I just love the formatting. So there is the LED connection. Which I commented out. Here's the parallel LED external export count control hex control. If we go back up to the body of the of the Verilog, we'll find that hex control is parsed into four four bit vectors and sent off to be displayed on the hexadecimal displays on the four. And this. This digit one, two, and three is a decoder that takes in binary here and puts out the pattern of, of, of segments that has to be displayed. Now, the decoder is at the bottom of this file someplace. 
It's a very simple little ROM. It is a, in fact, uh, set up as a read-only memory. You put in a, a number and out comes a segment list. So zero, you have to know the order of the segments on a seven segment display. And also know that they're active low. From which I infer that the leading one must be this segment, which we're going to turn off for a zero. So this just gives the list of all the segments that have to be turned on for each different hexadecimal digit. Moving back up to the body of the of the code hex 0 through hex 3 uppercase are IO ports to the FPGA so these modules connect the control from a parallel IO port which I defined to physical IO which appears on the board as digital The other, the other exported signal, count control, is going to modify a state machine, which on, on positive edge of clock 50 is incrementing a divider, a 24-bit divider, so 24 bits divides by um, um, 16 million, right? 2 to the 24th is 16 million more or less. So this is running at about three counts a second or so. If the divider is zero, it overflows about three times a second. When the divider goes to zero, we're going to increment a counter by the, by the signal imported from the parallel I.O. port, <coughs> count control, and display that on the red LED in binary. So two signals coming from parallel I ports, LED control, count control, or X control and, and count control. And those signals which appeared through QSIS are now usable in the variable. So these are two examples of using um, inputs over parallel I.O. What does it want to do and how is it over parallel I.O.? Just write to the parallel port. Write to, uh, so, so you are going to design a port that if, if it's an input, so these are outputs actually. These are outputs from the HPS. Ah. So an the FPGA is the outside world from the point of view of the micro so in your C codes, these are outputs. So now we go look at the C code, which is the third step. So we've looked at the QSYS, we've looked at the Verilog, now we have to go look at the C code. We'll take a look at that. Well, there's a bunch of, of, uh, of chunks to this, after the usual includes. We're going to give the uh, hardware register space as FF200000. That is the physical ARM assigned address for the I.O. ports corresponding to the FPGA. And a rather large span. By the way, the span on any one of these virtual memory conversion routines has to be given in pages. So every digit below every one of the bottom four, bottom three digits has to be zero. So the smallest possible span is X1000. So this is a fairly large span, much bigger than we need, but okay. 
Then we're going to produce a mass, which is just the span minus 1, so it's 1 F, 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 F. There's a, now a base address for the LED, which is 0 offset, and a offset for the hex, which is 10. Oh, where the hell did that come from? Okay, let's go back to the QSIS. And we see that for the parallel I.O. port here, the address is zero. Zero. And through F. So the address range is zero to F. So the par offset for the parallel I.O. port, LED parallel I.O. port is zero. And the offset for the PIO test port is So, those addresses come from the ones you chose in QSIS. And the only condition is that when you choose them, there can be no overlap between this parallel I port and the other parallel I O port. Or any other device hooked to the lightweight master. So then we go back to the C code. Question. Yes. So for the value code, we use the name that the next code and for the C code, we use the address that comes next to it. Because there's two different connections. There's the there is the connection that goes from there's the connection that goes this way up to the arm, which is ad which is an address map system. And there's the connection that goes this way over to the FPGA, which is by name. They have no relationship with each other except they're both connected to the same hardware, yes. So if we see kill directly on the line of four, it's going to hold its value until the next time directly on. It is a register, yes, so it holds a value. That's correct. Going back to the C code, there's some other stuff in here. This was an early lookup table I used for doing the hex to uh, hex conversion. I decided that was inelegant. It should be in hardware. So go to that. This is HPS side, IO, uh, IO based. So there's a separate range, FF7, which corresponds to local peripherals on the HPS, which are not the FPGA. Don't mess with those. Just don't. I was playing with them, but don't. Then we have to do the M mapping stuff to get to do the virtual, to do the real to virtual conversion. So we're going to define a couple of uh, unsigned in pointers here. Uh, open slash dev slash memory so that we can now map those pointers. Get the Lightweight virtual base, which has a, a span of above, I think it was hexadecimal 20,000, and the register's base, which is FF20. Then the, the lightweight LED address and the lightweight hex address, which is just, this is at the base. The LED PIO base is just zero, so that's sort of a useless add. Here I just added 10. I should have used the, the offset I defined earlier. Now that we have all of that defined, we can merely go into a little loop here which prints a prompt, waits for a step, sends the step to the contents of the LED pointer address. In other words, it writes the register. 
writes the register, then sends the same value, because I was lazy, to the hex address, the hex control address, and then it was also reading the HPS button. Again, don't do that. Then after it reads those two, whatever you entered here as a step appears on the display and controls the count on the FPGA. So now it's linked through the memory map. The link here is that the memory map you've defined maps to absolute hardware on the FPGA. Because there's a parallel I.O. port that links this bus address to real hardware on the other side of the module, on the, LA, on the FPGA side of the module. SRAM base address, which you will choose in the usual way from QSYS, and then there will be offsets 0 through 255, which you will write to in C, which corresponds to the 256 addresses of the SRAM block. So you will, you will each different address of the SRAM block will be pointed to by a sequential address in C, and then on the FPGA side will be read by a by issuing a read command from uh, for a given address. Not fast to set up. It takes some messing around with it to get it set up. Now, I, it, it, at various points, I've, I've I've messed with this some. One is to try to hook rather than going for SRAM or or or. Parallel I.O. ports, why not just use a pair of FIFOs? So th there's a pair of FIFOs here. It's FIFO HPS to FPGA and FIFO FPGA to HPS. So you can you can blast stuff into a FIFO from the HPS, read it on the FPGA side without an address. It's just the next thing that occurs on the queue is, is available. And there is a control register on each side that allows you to say, is there room to write a new value, is there something in there worth reading? So those control signals all exist. I might go through that. I, I, I don't want to do it right now. Yes? So if you do that, how do you know which variable uh, you're reading out to get? Well, then you have to have a protocol which says, hmm, the first one must be beta. How do I know it's the first one? Because I'm going to send a sync word before the first piece of data. So I'm going to send all Fs or something, or, or some non- you're using all 27-bit fixed points, so send something with a high bit set, which is an inv invalid number, and that would indicate that you're resetting the, the, the state machine which reads the FIFO, because now it's a serial system. This will give you about round trip to the, uh, round trip from the FPG, the HPS to the FPGA back to the HPS, it'll give you a couple of mega words a second, which is not fantastically fast, but um, there's faster ways to do it. So again, questions at this point. Well, let's go talk a little bit more about this logic analyzer then, as another example. Again, there's three pieces to the, 
to the interface, there's a uh, C program, which is going to have basically four possible calls you have to use. Start all of which, which does a bunch of memory setup, and I'll show you that. Then end, which says uh, whatever you're doing with the data from OLA, you're, you're done with it. And a print and a, and a, and a uh, draw command. A couple of variants of print. But let's start at the other end and look at the at the QSYS layout here. There is nothing in here in my in my example except the ARM, an SD RAM for VGA display of the waveforms. The AV config for VGA display, the VGA subsystem, but the two the two pieces which do all of the communication to the the two pieces of the logic that do all of the communication to the HPS are two RAM buffers. There's a control buffer which does read write to the to the ARM, and there's an analyzer buffer which is loaded at bus rate continuously. All the time you're trying to acquire data, it's, it's loading, it's just doing a circular buffer of length 1000 as fast as it can. When the trigger event occurs, it tags that memory location, loads a few hundred more samples and stops. So this is a 1024 by 32 bit RAM block. You can't tell by looking at it here, but if you if you double click the analyzer buffer thing, it allows you to set up the RAM size. It's set to ten uh, to ten twenty four words, and you can tell that because the memory goes from the base of eight hundred zero 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 hex to eight hundred zero FFF. So that's a, that's. A, Four thousand bytes, which is one thousand words. The the control buffer is set up as doesn't overlap. This one ends at FFF. This one starts at a thousand on the bus. So these are non-overlapping on the full speed bus on the heavyweight bus. This goes through three FF. So it's of size 256. Four bytes per word. So those are the two chunks that were added to make the the logic analyzer or the, or the lot data log really work. And the control, <coughs> any questions on that? The, the format is that the control buffer, the SRAM control, is going to have address zero be new data? Yes. The logic handler has to get new data, analyzer has to get new data from the HPS. Address one is arming the trigger. The arm is arming. Yeah, it's, it's, sorry about that. So is to is to uh, allow the capture to occur. Uh, address two is a trigger count. That's how many samples were taken after the trigger. Two fifty address two fifty is data capture complete. Two fifty one is the address in the buffer memory at which the trigger occurred, which the HPS needs to figure out where the trigger is in the data. And then two more 
which is uh, two more addresses, 255, which is a don't care mask for the trigger, and then the actual trigger word in 255, the actual match bit words. So you can choose to ignore some of the trigger bits by writing a zero in the don't care, and you can choose to enable those bits to do, to do the trigger by indicating the one in the match has to be exact, so it's a, it's a conjunctive trigger. So, so the, the analyzer memory is just a, a 1024 circular buffer that's being written as fast as possible, and the control buffer has these specific addresses used. There's lots of room for more control. I've already thought of a couple of things I should put in there. So, now we go look at the Verilog. For this. And there's the residual hexadecimal display that I leave in there because I find it useful for debugging sometimes if I want to get a quick 16-bit value out. Then there's the device under test. If you were to use OLA, this is where you would put your, <coughs> your compute module, your, your solver module. In this case, it's just a direct digital synthesis. I think I mentioned this last time. On positive edge clock 100, uh, we're, either, we're either resetting the accumulator to, to 16 bits of zero I try and size all of my signals for reasons that were mentioned before. Otherwise, the phase accumulator is incremented. The top set eight bits is grabbed off of the phase accumulator, and then that phase is used to address yet another ROM it's clock to clock 100. So this is now ROM that is implemented in sync RAM. It's, it's implemented in RAM that has been preloaded with an image and never written. Therefore, it is a ROM. Made three copies for three different tables. And those three signals now Sign one, sign two, and sign three will become the outputs I want to monitor with the logic analyzer. And to do that, we're going to we're going to assign the data input to be the top eight bits of the three signs plus the eight bits of the phase for a total of 32 bits. These can be any signals you want in any combination as long as they add up to 32 bits. This happens to be a handy format because 15 is the sign bit for each of the 16 bit signals down to the halfway point. So we're effectively truncating the 16 bit values after eight bits, but including the sign bit. Where's the table for that? Whoop! Down here at the bottom of the file is a gigantic, I did not generate this file by, I, by hand, I, I generated this in MATLAB. I wrote a MATLAB program that wrote Verilog ROMs. Um, module sync ROM clock address sign. Cordis infers that this should be in a RAM block because it is big enough to take up too much space to put in logic, or it takes up a lot of space in logic. And since every 
assign for every different value is a constant, it knows that it should be a ROM. So it builds a ROM and it builds it in in uh, M10K blocks. Any questions on that? So now we have to we have the, the sign up, but we have the data input to the, the logic analyzer. We need the trigger. And the trigger source here is going to be just whatever bits I felt like putting together. There's going to be key three, which is a push button, DUT reset, which is another push button, I think one. Six bit, 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 bits of zero because I need to pad out the 32 bits. Oh, another 16 bits of zero because I decided not to output any sign values for a trigger. And then the phase. So I can trigger on zero phase. I can trigger on phase equals 80, x at 80. I can trigger on either key three or DU key reset by choosing the correct trigger mask on the HPS. Now there's a bunch of internal wiring that has to go on here, which you don't need to know about to use this. All you need to know is what I've just said, and that is that you, you, you insert your code for a device of your test, you wire up the data input, you wire up the trigger input, done. However, there's a lot of stuff that goes on to support the logic analyzer logic, and uh, it comes down to manipulating memory and maintaining three state machines, simultaneously running state machines. There's the data sample state machine, there's the trigger state machine, and there is the control state machine. All of which are concurrently running all of the time. <clears throat> the logic analyzer then is abstracted as a module with some of the control signals coming from QSYS, read data, write data, at SRAM address, control read data, control write data, control address, are connected to QSYS, and some, which are connected to the FPGA fabric, clock 100, uh, reset is not P0, and the data input and the external trigger, which you would write. Down in then the QSYS module, this is now the module which is generated by QSYS when you hit generate. There will be SRAM address, SRAM RAM write, SRAM read data, SRAM write data. Oh, that's being linked through the, through the definition of the data memory signals here directly into the logic M. So the analyzer SRAM and the control SRAM shared blocks are then mapped directly into the logic analyzer. And sooner or later, I will figure out how to match, ma mash this all into a QSYS module. But it's more than a couple of weeks work and I haven't figured out how to do it yet. questions? One big piece of this is to keep straight in your mind. What's being generated by QSYS? What do you have to do in Verilog? And how do you control it from the HPS? In this case, the RAM modules are being generated by QSYS. All that you have to provide are the control signals from Verilog.
Now, I don't want to go through this, the whole logic analyzer because it is a mess. Um, but after the, all of these control signals are imported into the module, or are linked into the module, uh, there's going to be a state machine which runs at clock 100. And let me just look at this. At this, at the, the trigger state machine is actually rather simple. There's one state. It says, is there a trigger? Is there a trigger? Is there a trigger? Is there a trigger? That gets locked out. It checks for a trigger on every cycle. But it doesn't actually issue a trigger unless the arm trigger arm control is set from the HPS which case immediately issues a trigger. Reset obviously resets everything and then in state zero, analyzer state zero, on every cycle we're going to take a, a data input, that's now from your device under test, put it into SRAM write data, set the SRAM ad address to SRAM write address, set write to one, and simultaneously update the SRAM write address for the next cycle. Because since these are non-blocking assigns, they all happen in exactly the same instance. So you're writing the current address, you're writing to the current address and incrementing simultaneously the address for the next write. That has to be the case because you need to do a, re a write on every cycle to get the data necessary for doing the logic analysis. If the trigger, if, there, if the trigger happened, we're going to immediately reset the trigger. We're going to go to a different analyzer state. We're going to take the current write address and put it into a, a location where the HPS can find it. Set the current count to zero because now we want to count to a number specified by the HPS for the number of samples after the trigger. And if the analyzer state is D2, with no break now, with no, with no separation in time, we have to write memory because we can't miss a cycle. Have to immediately take more data, increment the SRAM write address, and then check to see if we have the, current no the correct number of, of uh, samples yet. If we don't, add one to the current count and take some more. Otherwise, we're going to set the complete flag, set the analyzer state to D3, set the complete to one, and wait for the HPS to come do something. Josh. Yeah, notice there's a uh, like an arrow inside that if statement. Is that supposed to be that? Where? In the if current count gets true count. If that's less than or equal. Oh, the, okay. Yes, it's the the, the context dependent parser. <laughs> that's so confusing. That's one reason that this particular construct is not allowed in an assignment is not allowed in a if statement in Verilog. Unlike C, where an assignment is allowed. Thanks for pointing that out. Then we're going to wait for the uh, HPS to read all the data points, and when complete gets set back to zero, or it's set by one here, how does it get set back to zero? Oh, because the HPS is going to set back to zero when it's done. Then we go back to state zero and start taking data again. C code a little bit since we're getting a 
little short on time here. I've been playing endlessly with the C code, but this is one version. So the bus address is the high speed bus is C0000. This just recapitulates the address, addresses that I mentioned before in the Verilog. We set up the FPGA SRAN base. FPJ SRAM span, the analyzer offset, the analyzer control. Then We do a whole bunch of of of, uh, of setup for the for the the graphics, and we need print draw routines, and we need uh, putty serial terminal control codes, graphic support, draw text, uh, pixel, pixels and text, different colors that I predefined for your viewing pleasure you know, on the on the VGA. The real, the virtual memory at variables. So here we need to grab the um, addresses of the control SRAM and the analyzer SRAM and the pixel base because we want to be able to draw waveforms. The conversion from hex to binary. Open all of the virtual memory ports we need. Do a VGA box from 0 to, uh, zero, zero to 630, by, 630 by 480, dark blue, that clears the screen. Do a text clear, that clears the text. Write text into a couple of, uh, at X1 position, lines 56 and 57. And then prompt for a, prompt the user for a trigger mask and a trigger value. Oh, and a horizontal scale because I want to be able to zoom dynamically zoom the the display. And then we're going to write. We clear the screen again. Write some trigger information. And then arm the, the, the logic analyzer. So when you do a start, hold up, the trigger mask, the trigger value, as soon as you read both those values in to the control state machine on the FPGA side, the arm arms the trigger and sits there and waits until an event happens on the FPGA side. So if you say, if you give it the, if you ask for the high order bit trigger, which was key three, then when you press key three, the system will acquire data, a thousand points and return. So this will just hang here until it gets a valid trigger. If you specify an impossible trigger, it'll hang forever. Once you do that, then you can draw these waves. I think we talked about this last time, how this is parsed. This means draw a wave starting at bit zero of the data word, going for eight bits, formatted as an unsigned integer at vertical position 100 on the screen with vertical scale two and horizontal scale set by whatever the human entered to make it red.
draw some other stuff, you print some binary, you fiddle around, you print a table, blah, blah, blah. When you get all done with the data, whatever you're going to do, then you do an end ola, and that tells the data, the, the logic analyzer, that you're done with the data, you don't want it anymore. You could have written it to a file, of course, because it's Linux and it's a file system. <clears throat> but in any case, you say uh, end ola, it releases the lock on the analyzer memory, it starts to acquire data again and waits for the next arm command, the next trigger arm command from the HPS. Now, behind the scenes, there's a bunch of stuff going on. The start OLA command is going to is going to arm the system. Pointer pointer uh, control SRAM pointer plus one was the arm position. It's going to set the trigger position, trigger count. It's going to set the trigger mask, whatever the human asked for, and the and uh, Turger value, volley, turger volley, to uh, whatever value you ask for. And then, when everything is completely set up, it's going to set the control SRAM pointer offset zero to one, which says, there's new data tells the FPGA there's new data. As soon as it reads that, it, it grabs the rest of these values and starts to, and, and arms the trigger. So, three pieces. The C program is gonna manipulate one port of QSYS. Verilog is gonna manipulate the other port of the RAM on QSYS. And the effect is that you're going to be able to log data at about 100 megahertz. Any questions? What example do you want to see next? Well, we'll talk. Well, what's next? Um, Okay, so you can be in lab any time. My primary job is to make sure you have whatever access you need. I assume by now you've all tested your cards and they all work. <laughs>